Multiple linear regression, F test and partial F D test, multi collinear table. It's a bread and butter, baby. What's your jam? Greetings, Bio6611. In this lecture, we're going to look at diagnostic plots and the issue of multicollinearity in the context of multiple linear regression. We'll start by just briefly revisiting those assumptions for linear regression before seeing how we can modify some of those plots we previously introduced in the context of simple linear regression for multiple linear regression. And then we'll discuss the issue of multicollinearity, or the correlation of our predictor variables. As we saw in our introductory lecture on multiple linear regression, the assumptions are pretty similar for multiple as compared to simple linear regression. In this case though, instead of having a single x predictor variable, we might have something like k predictor variables or multiple. Each of our assumptions then, similar before, are now contingent though or conditional on the fact that we have fixed combinations of these multiple predictor variables. As we'll see though, we'll be able to evaluate things like linearity, homoscedasticity, and normality based on plots much like we did previously. So let's just touch base again about those four major plots we introduced before for how we evaluated the appropriateness of our modeling assumptions for simple linear regression. We looked at a yx scatter plot, or the observed outcome and the observed predictor, we looked at a scatter plot of our residuals and the predictor of interest x. We also then plotted a histogram of the residuals and then a PP or a QQ plot of the residuals. We can note as well that we used jackknife residuals and we discussed this a bit more extensively about the pros and cons of different residuals previously, but we could technically use any type of residual we might be interested in. In the context of multiple linear regression, we'll see a similar setup and idea, but we'll see that there's going to be two potential modifications we can consider. The first is instead of the yx scatter plot, we'll use a partial regression plot, which we'll introduce next. Instead of then the scatter plot of the residuals with a single predictor x, we can look at also this relationship of the scatter plot of the predicted value y hat and the residuals. So let's start with what we call a partial regression plot. This is also known as a partial plot, an added variable plot, or just an adjusted variable plot. It tries to characterize the relationship between the dependent variable y and an independent variable x, adjusting for all of the other covariates in the model. So we might just denote those c sub 1, c sub 2, up to c sub k, whatever other number of covariates we have. We can calculate the partial regression plot by following three steps. The first is that we can perform a regression of our outcome on the covariates that don't include our independent variable x, and we would save the observed residuals, or the raw residuals, that difference between y hat, our predicted value, and y. In step two, we'll perform a regression of that independent, independent variable x on those covariates of interest, C1, C2, up to CK that are left in the model. And we'll save the observed residuals from that plot. Then we simply plot the residuals from step one and step two and can evaluate some of the similar properties we looked at previously for the YX scatter plot for a simple linear regression model. What we see here is a slew of code in R that we can use to implement the steps we saw on the previous slide. So for example, we're going to be leveraging our Rosner FEV um, data set, and we're going to pretend that we're fitting a model or the context of predicting FEV based on age and height. Because we have two predictor variables, technically we have two different partial plots we can generate. One for the predictor where our independent variable of interest is age, and height is treated as an extra covariate, or we can flip the roles and have the partial plot be for an independent variable height and age is that other covariate we're trying to adjust for. What we see here is our first two steps of that process. We fit a regression for just FEV on the covariate of height when we're interested in the independent variable age. And in step two, we fit a regression model where age is the outcome and height is still our predictor. We then simply will make a scatter plot 
of the residuals, the observed residuals from our model um, for both of those two stages and steps. And then we'll add a simple linear regression line to also indicate the slope between the two. And we can repeat that process for the partial plot as well for height. When we do so, we can look at the, again, relationship between those residuals on both the regressor for our various predictor of interest and then the dependent residual um, of that y that we're looking at. For both of these partial plots, we see that there does appear to be a linear relationship of some sort, maybe a bit more of a strong relationship for height rather than age, but we can also see that there is a decent spread of the points, but a few that may be sort of atypical out of the boundaries. For example, if we were to draw some just sort of boundaries around these two lines, roughly speaking, we might see that there are a few points that are starting to deviate from the other points we see. One interesting connection to note about the partial regression plot is that the slope of that partial plot, the lines we saw in the previous slide, will be the same as the slope of the predictor or the independent variable x from our multiple linear regression model of y on actually all of our terms, x, c1, c2, up to ck. In other words, a simple linear regression of the residuals from step one on step two will actually result in the exact same estimate of the beta hat for our independent variable from the multiple logistic regression model. For example, we see on the slide below here, the example comparing the multiple logistic regression model here for our terms with then the two simple linear regression models based on our observed residuals. What we can note is that when we're looking here at age, we have that same matched estimate as well as standard error in our table. And likewise for height, we have that exact same estimate from the simple linear regression of the residuals with the multiple linear regression. So this is just another way we can evaluate first if we've implemented the process correctly, and two to also note that we get the exact same estimate by plotting the residuals against one another in this procedure. A more generally useful, or at least immediately intuitive plot though, might be a scatter plot of our predicted outcome y hat and some residuals. This will replace then our scatter plot of the residuals by the independent variable x. And by plotting the scatter plot of our residuals by y hat, we can account then for the relationship amongst all of the independent variables we're interested in, x1, x2, up to the kth independent variable included in the model. With this plot, we can check similar assumptions that we saw before, such as the linearity of our overall model and the assumption of homoscedasticity. For example, do the residuals on the plot appear to jump around a horizontal line or a residual value of zero for all values of y hat? And this would be evaluating the linearity assumption. We may ask ourselves then the question when we're looking at the figure on the following slides, do the residuals form a horizontal band around that zero line. If so, and there's not much of a shape to it, like a fan, uh, we would think the homoscedasticity assumption of equal variances may be appropriate. As a point just to bring up now that we'll talk about in more detail later on in the semester, we may also be able to look at if any of the points seem extremely large or small relative to the other points in the data set. In other words, do we have potential outliers that we may need to be evaluating in greater detail or concerned about? So let's look at an example with that model we fit previously for predicting FEV based on age and height. What we see here is actually some assumptions that may be violated. First of all, we see that there is the following of that dashed line at our jackknife residual of zero here approximately well, but it appears that our points have an increasing variance at larger predicted values of FEV. So perhaps our assumption of homoscedasticity is violated and potentially depending on the fact that we may see sort of a shoehorn shape here or a swoosh, we may also be concerned slightly about linearity. As we discussed in the context of simple linear regression, there are transformations we can take to our predictors and or outcome variable to try to adjust some of these potential violations. For example, we may choose to fit a model where we log transform the FEV. And in this case then, 
we're looking at the model on the natural log scale for FEV with the predictors of age and height. We might use this as our first step to see if it better addresses those model assumptions. And in fact, it does appear to do so. We see that for the most part, the data is pretty nicely evenly distributed around our horizontal line at a value of zero for the jackknife residual. And there's also next to no fan-shaped pattern taking place. In addition to that, we could note as well that there might be a few points that we are concerned about as potential outliers, and in the future, we'll talk about how to investigate a little more in detail. And so with that, we have two new tools we can use or plots to visualize the data in the context of multiple linear regression. But with multiple predictors also comes this potential challenge of dealing with what we call multicollinearity. And it has a closely related term of collinearity or multicollinearity, where collinearity is strictly speaking that we have two explanatory variables with a linear association, and multicollinearity is the more general expansion to two or more explanatory variables that are highly linearly related. In general, the idea we're trying to convey here is that we may have highly correlated predictors. At the extreme end of that, one predictor may be a perfectly linear combination of the other predictors. For example, if we have three independent variables or explanatory variables in our model, and x3 was actually just equal to 2 times x1 minus x2, then we would have a perfect association relationship, which would lead to some problematic issues, even if they're not perfectly related. The first is that it can be difficult then to determine the true effect of each predictor on the outcome, because if we have highly correlated variables, they may lead to poorly estimated coefficients and standard errors. In other words, we can have misleading p-values or potentially wonky confidence intervals that contextually don't make sense. It also can be problematic because we could potentially end up in a case where an overall f-test provides a significant result, but if we evaluate each of the predictors individually, we have a bunch of inconclusive or non-significant p-values. And again, getting back to that idea that we may have poorly estimated coefficients and standard errors. Fortunately, we have ways to evaluate this idea of multicollinearity, and one of the most common is known as a variance inflation factor, or VIF, V-I-F. It's often used to measure the collinearity in the context of multiple linear regression, and we compute it as the jth predict for each jth predictor variable with this following formula, where the VIF for that jth predictor will be equal to 1 over 1 minus r sub j squared. And this is going to be a little familiar with a bit of a twist. It's going to be our coefficient of determination that we discussed in the context of simple linear regression previously, but it's going to be based on the multiple linear regression model regressing xj as the outcome on the remaining k minus 1 predictors. In other words, if we want to think about that here for a second, what we'll have is xj is equal to beta naught plus beta 1, maybe x1 plus beta 2, x2, plus some other error term itself. And so instead of fitting with the outcome, we'll fit that model of that one predictor left out with all the others as their predictors. And we'll do that for every single variable we have. A rule of thumb then after we repeat this process is that if we have a VIF that's greater than 10, we would be concerned about the presence of multicollinearity. And this would correspond equivalently to this rj squared of 0.9 or larger. And so some practical considerations for how we might want to deal with the variance inflation factor indicating multicollinearity before seeing an example on the following slide. The first is that we should consider if it just makes sense. For example, if we have an interaction term in the model or we've included some polynomial term, for example, the predictor squared, then we would expect those to be correlated without any additional transformations being taken. Another way to approach this is if it doesn't seem like they should be an interaction or some polynomial term where we've induced the correlation, we might want to choose the variable with the largest adjusted R squared in the model to consider dropping or keeping in just relative to these other terms. We could create a new variable where appropriate. For example, maybe we see height and weight for some reason are correlated, but then maybe we can use something like BMI.
And finally, another extreme would be to use principal components analysis of our variables, except this would be more useful for cases with a larger number of covariates or predictors, and we won't discuss in greater detail in our class. I want to just briefly walk through a couple examples of how we can look at multicollinearity in a few different contexts to again get at that does it make sense and also maybe there's something going on that we should be concerned about. The first thing to note here is that we'll be using the VIF function from the car package. So we're loading that first. The first model we're going to fit is just using our FEV data set and including all the predictors we have. So age, height, sex, and smoking status. When we look at the variance inflation factors for each of these four terms, we see that they are all less than 10. So we can be happy here in this case that we don't think multicollinearity is an issue between these predictors. In our second example here, we're looking at a case where I've induced correlation by adding a term for age squared to the model. So we see here we have a predictor for age, but then also one where we've squared that term as well as just keeping height in the model as our example. For this model fit, if we calculate the variance inflation factors, we see that we do have values that are greater than 10 here. So in that case, we may be concerned at first before we realize that it's really this polynomial relationship that's likely inducing the correlation. We can also note that height itself has a value less than 10. So we're probably pretty comfortable with this model with respect to multicollinearity. For our third example, let's consider a case where we've defined a relationship where this new var variable is equal to three times the height of a person plus the square root of their age. Now for our example, let's pretend that we don't know it has that relationship, it's just a variable in our model, and we go ahead and we fit a multiple linear regression with age, sex, height, and this new var as our four predictors of interest. We then fit and calculate the variance inflation factors with the VIF function, and we get the results we see on the screen here, where sex has a VIF less than 10, so we wouldn't be concerned at this point, but we can note that age, height, and nu var all have very large VIFs, much larger than 10. So at this point, if we didn't know there was some relationship between age, height, and nu var, we might start by looking at leaving one of them out of the model and seeing how that affects the variance inflation factors and see if that corrects for the high level of collinearity we've observed. And so with that, we'll wrap up this lecture which introduced some ways to evaluate assumptions about our multiple linear regression framework with some modifications to plots we saw previously for simple linear regression while also examining how we can evaluate the potential of highly correlated predictors that may throw off our interpretation or results of our model.